Hello again, my name is Rene Nahera. I'm a doctor of public health and epidemiologist and the editor of the historyofvaccines.org website. In uh, part one of this introduction to vaccine epidemiology, I talked to you a little bit about epidemiology and what it meant. Very quickly, very quick review, epidemiology is the study of that which comes upon the people. In this case, it's the study of what vaccines do for populations and to populations. And we're going to talk about basic sciences basic scientific stuff that you need to know this time around. In case you missed it, the first part, a uh, section about a little history, I have the link to that in the description below. And there's also going to be a quick little banner that will pop up on the top right for you to uh, click on. It's a quick history of uh, vaccines. And you can always go to historyofvaccines.org and read up some more there. So today we're going to talk about some basic concepts, and I wrote basic concepts, but it's basic science concepts because science rules. We're going to talk about those basic concepts in the next few minutes, about 20 minutes or so. Again, link to the first part, it will be in the description, and subsequent parts as they get posted, there will be the links there. You'll also get a quick, quick little banner showing up on the top right. If you want to go see those, then you can be familiar with the history of vaccines and then come back and watch this video. So first, let's just talk about some basic virology. This is uh, uh, your base, basic structure of a virus here on the left. And a virus is composed of uh, proteins on its surface that can be of many different shapes, chemically and structurally. These then become what we, talk, what we call antigens. And antigens are the structures or the little pieces of material, both from a bacteria and a virus and a parasite that cause the immune response. We usually call them immunogens, but for the sake of this this very basic um, in virology, we're gonna we're gonna call them antigens. So they're on the surface, but other things in the viruses can be antigens. The enzymes might trigger immune an immune response. The viral genome might trigger an immune response. The caspid might trigger an immune response. The envelope might trigger an immune response as well. So it all um, could be an immunogen. It's just a matter of which part gets swallowed up and processed by the immune system and we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. Here on the right I have the basic pathway of how a virus gets into a cell and so the virin or the virus attaches to the cell and then it enters the cell, the cell opens up and swallows it or the virus uses some of its antigens to open the cell or tell the cell to open up and then the virus gets inside. Once it's inside, it sheds its, uh, its outer structures, the envelope or the or the capsid, and releases its, its genome into the cell's nucleus. So that's what makes a virus a virus is that it doesn't, it doesn't replicate on its own like a more advanced cell like a bacteria or our, our cells, our human cells would do. It needs to hijack the machinery of another cell and then it multiplies in there, it creates all its little structures that are going to be assembled. They get assembled out in the cytoplasm of the cell. And then the new virus gets assembled and sheds out of the cell. And you have hundreds, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of new viruses after this. The cell gets destroyed. It doesn't survive the process and that is what causes you to have the viral symptoms when you get a viral infection. That that inflammation, that feeling of yuckiness when you get a cold, it's because all those cells in your respiratory system are being um, basically used up and blown up by the viruses. Same thing when you get hepatitis, it's the, the cells in your liver. Or when you get encephalitis, it's the cells in your brain. And for the most part, viruses are very specific to what tissue they attach. And like hepatitis, for example, when you get it, it, it likes cells in the liver. So it goes to the liver, it causes inflammation and causes damage there. On the other hand, you have something like the flu. It likes the respiratory uh, pathways and so it attaches to your throat, your nose, your uh, respiratory system and causes inflammation and damage there. Of course, there is there is something uh, to be said about the immune system causing damage and response to this, but that is for a more advanced virology and more advanced immunology course. For the purposes of this epidemiology of vaccines, explainer just know that viruses have those antigens on the surface and they also enter the cells and cause damage by hijacking the cell's own machinery to make new uh, DNA or RNA. And then the viruses come out. That's another thing you need to keep in mind. Viruses come in RNA or DNA flavors. There's a, 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 a slight difference there. It's important when we're talking about, for example, HIV, for which it's hard to get a vaccine created versus measles, which we have basically the same vaccine from uh, many, many, many years ago because the measles virus is very stable. And it's unstable because RNA is just a little more unstable than DNA. And so when the virus, like the HIV virus replicates, the viruses are all, are all different versus when the measles virus replicates, the viruses all basically look the same 
with regards to their proteins on the surface and how the immune system reacts to them. If you have a virus that is always changing, like the flu or HIV, then the immune system is going to have a hard time adapting because these antigens are going to be changing. The antibodies cannot attach, and we'll talk about that in immunology. But when it's like DNA, it's very constant. You have the same antigens being produced over and over again with very little variation. Next is some basic bacteriology. So here we have a bacteria. And just for reference, I put a, a virus over here. As you can see, much, much tiny than a bacteria much much simpler a bacteria is more complex it has all these structures on its surface which act as antigens it has all these structures on the inside in the cytoplasm which act as antigens as well it has a plasma membrane it has a cell wall it has a capsule some of them have capsules some, some of them are un uncapsulated some of them have flagella to help them move uh, some of them do not and so some are motile what we call motile uh, and some of them are not. And they come in two big flavors, basically. Gram positive, gram named after the creator of a stain so that we can see them under the microscope. And gram positives look a little bit purple under the microscope once they're stained. And the gram negatives, the gram negatives do not stain and so they uh, look a little bit pink uh, on a pink background or a little bit dark pink on a, on a red background. So again, what you need to know about bacteria, they cause all sorts of different diseases, but they have their own mechanism for multiplying. They don't need to invade your cells. Some of them do, but not because they, they need to replicate inside the cell. They do it as a matter of survival, as a matter of avoiding your immune system, and as a matter of creating the environment for themselves to multiply, but they're not using up your own cell biology to multiply. Um, and, and again, they're, they're very big, and so they can be broken down. We need some different cells to break down bacteria versus the cells that can attack and break down viruses. And this also has implications for things like infection control bacteria you know you can you can you, you probably have a little bit of a harder time killing them you need to bring them up to have very high temperature you need to dry them out or you need to attack them chemically viruses because they're so simple a simple um, solution of 10% Clorox 10% bleach usually takes care of most viruses out there bacteria some of their structures uh, on the surface can be toxins uh, to us so they cause toxic reactions so for example cholera uh, it's not so much the bacteria itself that gives you the very heavy diarrhea that almost completely empties you out it's the toxin that is created that makes your intestines so if this is your intestinal wall and you have all this water on one side and this and the bacteria are out here what the bacteria will do when they attach to your intestinal wall is that they they trigger the cells to start just pumping out enormous amounts of water and we're talking a lot of water in the case of cholera and it's because of the toxin and so uh, even when you kill the bacteria with antibiotics you might not get rid of the toxin altogether yet and you still have symptoms and also that's another important distinction between bacteria and viruses that you have antibiotics that are very uh, useful for many of the bacteria that are out there although some are becoming resistant, but that is for a more advanced course on bacteriology. And uh, for viruses, you have antivirals, and you, for the most part, you, you just let the, the viral infection run its course. You can't give somebody antibiotics for a bacterial infection. So this is some very basic uh, bacteriology. Now here, uh, we have some basic immunology, very basic. So the antigen, if you remember, it's those little, little proteins or little sugars or little fats that come off of the cells or the surface of cells, like uh, bacterial cells, or the surface of viruses viruses and it is presented it is taken up by an antigen presenting cell the antigen presenting cell will then process that antigen and show it to a t helper cell which will process it a little bit further and present it to a b cell the b cell will look at the antigen and create corresponding antibodies so that the antibodies will attach to those antigens, whether they're floating around freely or if the antigens are attached to a virus or a bacteria. And then once that happens, what happens is that the bacteria, we have a big giant bacteria over here, all of a sudden gets attacked by a whole bunch of antibodies that are sticking to its surface and it's not able to grow, reproduce, attach itself to another cell. It, it might get uh, attacked and, and a, a, hole gets, uh, a hole gets chemically uh, made into it and it bursts. Basically, antibodies are just freely roaming around looking for those specific antigens. They're very sp Some of them are very specific as to which antigens they attach to. The other thing about B cells and antibodies is that after a long time, the B cells become memory cells. They keep memory of what is going on and so they go and circulate around you inside of you 
and if the bacteria comes along again or the virus comes along again you don't have to go through this process of the antigen presenting cell and the t cells and the b cells the b cells will immediately recognize that something's going on they'll release the antibodies and that's how you have immunity for a, hopefully a long time immunity wanes with time especially if you don't get boosted and we'll talk about that here in a little bit uh, the other thing that happens is that t helper cells are given the um the antigen to macrophages and these macrophages go around and literally eat uh, that is what phages, uh, like your esophagus, phages, um, they eat the bacteria or they eat the cells that are infected with the virus because they look around and they see, oh, hey cell, how, how are you? You're covered in, um, in antigens, I am going to eat you. Or you have a virus inside of you, uh, I need to destroy you because we need to stop that virus from replicating. And another way of killer T cell, another thing that happens is that T helper cells activate killer T cells and the killer T cells do some of the similar things that macrophages do, but instead of eating the cell or instead of eating the bacteria, the killer T cells use chem chemicals called cytokines that do uh, the killing for them. And so what happens is that your initial antibody and T cell response at the first exposure here you have a big peak, you get over the disease and it starts waning, it starts coming down. But then all of a sudden you get attacked again, you get boosted again, you get exposed to the disease again, and you have another uh, rise in antibodies and cells, but without the disease this time because they reacted very quickly, they defended you before the the infection even set in and, and you're clear. And many years later you can be attacked again and you have another spike in antibodies and cells again without disease because you were protected once more. And so it's very important that you understand this boosting effect because we're going to talk about it when we talk, talk about the epidemiological shift, uh, especially with chickenpox. So when you get a disease like chickenpox or measles, the children who have that, that chickenpox or measles, they, they keep having it generation after generation. Like year after year, children are born and they get chickenpox. And you as an adult, you get boosted by being in contact with these kids. Um, and so you get boosted in every year, every couple of years, you come into contact with some kid with chicken pox out in the community and you get boosted and reboosted. And so you, your immune system stays up to date on what to do. But let's say that we get rid of chicken pox. What happens then? We'll talk about that in the epidemiological shift section. And now let's talk about some basic chemistry. So if you're going to talk about vaccines, you got to talk about chemistry and you have to talk about toxicology because of all the controversies that have been attached, some fairly, some unfairly to vaccines. And some of the things that are out there saying that vaccines are toxic, when in fact, there is no evidence of this, both on the epidemiological scale of looking at large populations and how many vaccines have been given out, and also on the molecular scale of looking at what is actually contained in vaccines and how chemistry reacts. So let's, let's, Take this in three sections. The first section, so let's talk about sodium and chloride. Sodium and chloride by themselves behave very differently than when they're brought together as a compound. So sodium as a metal, you add it to water and you, you can cause a very explosive reaction because it causes a, an exothermic uh, reaction. It's a reaction that gives off heat. Chloride by itself can be a, an irritant. It causes irritation. Uh, it reacts with other compounds around it very easily. And um, just, you can see it when you add it to swimming pools, how much of an irritant it can be to your eyes, to your skin. Uh, although it kills bacteria and keeps the, the pool hygienic, it still causes irritation that you need to take care of by showering after you get into the pool. And so you see that by themselves, sodium and, and chloride are kind of, you know, not, not good, right? But when you bring them together, sodium and chloride, when you bring them together, notice that one has a positive charge and the other one has a negative charge. You bring them together, it's table salt. And table salt is not that bad, right? Table salt, you add it to your food, you add it on your recipes, it makes things taste better. We need it in our blood in order to balance our, our fluids. Salt is, is one of those things that is ubiquitous in nature. The sea is you know, it's filled with, with salt water and it's, it's cool. So there is a difference between talking about an element just by itself and it being dangerous and talking about an element in a compound and it being dangerous and the chemistry is different. So now let's talk about these guys here. This guy up here at the top is ethanol and ethanol is found in alcoholic drinks and you can drink safely yeah, you know depending on your size and your weight and your tolerance and your liver status you, you can drink quite a bit of it before it makes you sick and, and kills you i mean you can it, it's you know you can you can drink a lot <laughs> this one on the bottom is methanol and methanol is no good methanol as little as an ounce can can cause 
you to go blind, that's less than what's in a shot of tequila, What if it was ethanol, but this is methanol, M-E ethanol, because it has only one, one carbon here in the center, whereas ethanol has two carbons. Methanol can cause blindness at very small amounts. It can cause death at very small amounts. It's it's really something uh, something bad. And why is that? It's because when it reacts in the liver, it gets turned into something called formic acid. And formic acid gets into your cells and stops them from being able to use oxygen properly and it just suffocates your cells. Whereas ethanol, the liver has the enzymes necessary to uh, deal with it, to break it down into less toxic uh, compounds and then to clear it out of your system by making it more water soluble and then you just pee it out. Why is the body unable to deal with, with these two things that are very similar chemically? Uh, why does it deal differently with ethanol than methanol? Well, it has to do with the chemistry. It's much easier to break ethanol right there and then add something more to it uh, there and there than it is to break this right here and add something to it. The, the break usually occurs over here and other things, other things happen um, without getting too much into a chemistry lesson. But also evolutionarily, we as, as humans and, and primates, we encountered uh, alcohols when fruit ferments. And when fruit ferments, we consumed it. And those of us that had the enzyme to deal with alcohol, we adapted and passed on that gene. And further on down the line, humans were able to uh, consume alcohol and deal with it enzymatically in the liver. Whereas we don't, we don't encounter methanol in, in nature uh, that often. You see it sometimes in very tiny amounts, very, very small amounts when something is being has been burned to a crisp. But you see it mostly when uh, people try to distill alcohol in wood and, uh, and with heat. And so that's called uh, wood alcohol. And it's used for industrial purposes, not to be consumed, but people sometimes accidentally consume it. And uh, since we didn't encounter it in nature as we were developing... Uh, towards being modern day humans, <laughs> we don't have the machinery necessary to deal with it and it causes blindness, it causes death. So now, for the last part here, let's look at this little element here. And this is the very feared mercury. Now mercury by itself, by itself it can be an industrial contaminant, it, it needs a lot of Clean up. Uh, if you have a mercury thermometer at home, I would recommend that you find a way to get rid of it because if it breaks, it can be very toxic. Mercury vapors are in extremely toxic if you inhale them. Uh, it can cause some, some bad damage to your brain and your lungs. But notice kind of what I said over here um, in the far left. By itself, it's something totally different than in a compound. And this com compound here is thimerosal. Um, and what thimerosal is, is a a preservative added to vaccines, especially the the vaccines that have a dead components in it. And it is added in order to prevent fungal and bacterial growth. So what happened back in the early 1900s is that vaccines were being given to children for, uh, I believe it was diphtheria. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But anyways, vaccines were given out and they would not be refrigerated very well. And you still see this nowadays and they're not refrigerated very well. And uh, bacteria grow on, on those vaccines. Uh, fungus grows on those vaccines. You give the vaccine to the kid, the kid gets a sepsis or gets some sort of a bad reaction to it and they get sick. So thimerosal was developed to be added to vaccines. Not only is it less harmful because it's a, it's a, an organomeric mercury and it Taking it the same from the ethanol and the methanol, thimerosal is an ethyl mercury. And the mercury that you usually see associated with fish, which is also an organic mercury, is methyl mercury. And so you can then see ethyl and methyl, ethanol and methanol. You can kind of see the same thing going on there where the body deals differently with Ethyl, more, ethyl mercury than it does with methyl mercury. The other thing is that it's it's in not not very high concentrations in vaccines. It's actually at very 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 tiny little concentrations. You probably get more mercury from drinking uh, water uh, just off the the tap, uh, or drinking uh, or eating than anything else because mercury is in the environment from many different sources. So uh, one of the things to not be afraid of when you see, oh, it's got thimerosal, like the flu vaccine has thimerosal in it. And children, children's vaccines, for the most part, have been done away with thimerosal, which brings issues of keeping them in cold storage. But even the flu vaccine has it, except the single-dose vaccine. The multi-dose vaccines have it. And uh, nothing to worry about, because again, it's not methylmercury, it's ethylmercury. It's very tiny amounts. And it's also in a compound that the body gets rid of it in a matter of hours. So that's something that you need to know when it comes to chemistry. This last little little thing here that I have it this is formaldehyde 
and if you notice, it's just missing one H from being being uh, uh, methanol, right? But again, chemistry has something to do with this because that H is not there, it behaves completely different. And so formaldehyde in the body, we produce it as a part of natural cell um, metabolism. We produce more than is contained inside a vaccine. And yet there are certain elements, certain people out there that say, oh, if formaldehyde is in the vaccine, then you're going to get it and you're going to die. Well, no, because I make more of it in my body every single day than what comes from a vaccine. And trust me, there is no difference in the formaldehyde here that is made by my body than the formaldehyde that is made by chemical um, chemical reactions. There's no such thing as a natural formaldehyde. And the other thing is that formaldehyde is it's found in everything that's living. So when you eat a fruit, when you eat a, a vegetable, when you eat meat, you're eating formaldehyde, not in big concentrations, tiny little concentrations, m much more than you would find in a vaccine and still not not bad, right? So again, just uh, keep in mind that when it comes to chemistry and toxicology, with toxicology, the dose makes the poison. That's what toxicologists talk about. Uh, it's, not so much, it's not so much that a poison can be killing you, it's how much of the poison can kill you. And when it comes to chemistry, things react differently depending on how they're arranged chemi chemically uh, on compounds and how if, and if they're by themselves. And so the last basic Thing that we need to think about is the basic reproduction number. The basic reproduction number says that an individual here on the left can infect yay many people in the first, first round of infections. So in the case of measles, it can be up to 18 people, but let's say 16. So an infected person goes into a room and there's 16 people who are susceptible. There's no, no vaccinated people in there. Everybody is totally susceptible to the infection. They can infect between uh, 9 and 18, usually 16 people. And then those 16 people go on and infect another 16. And then those 16 go on and infect another 16. And you can see how a, a measles epidemic can go from being just one case to being hundreds very quickly. A basic reproduction number represented by the R0 sign here of one means that this person will just infect one other person. And that's that's okay. I mean, that, you know, not as bad as measles, but still, you know, you have only one. And in these, these cases, the outbreaks are pretty self-limited. You have one person that infects another, that infects another, that infects another. And it just kind of dies out the minute that some intervention is put into place. And then there are some r knots that are less than one in which uh, an infected person needs to be in a room with thousands and thousands and thousands of other people to even infect one person. Um, and so that is an r knot of less than one. So again, when it's less than one, your epidemic curve is usually just the one person and it kind of dies out quickly over time, usually without an intervention. When it is equal to one, you start out with one person and you just go one person at a time throughout the different generations of the disease. And as soon as you do something about it, it quickly ends. An R0 of over one, is, you can start with one and then it, you can see how it can grow exponentially until something gets done and maybe then it'll level off or go down. So this is very important to know the, the basic reproduction number, especially when we're talking about vaccine effectiveness and efficacy. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so next time we're going to talk about herd immunity, which is no longer being called herd immunity as much. Now we're calling it community immunity to try to understand that we're talking about humans and not cattle. Although it was in cattle that this phenomenon was first observed. Uh, we're going to talk about it really quickly. Another quick video next time. So stay tuned for that. Again, the link to part one will be here. The link to part three when it's when it's uh, uploaded will be here as well if you're watching this later. And uh, we'll just keep track of all the links in the descriptions of all the videos. Thank you for your time and have a good one.